Hello there, friends. Today is Monday, December 23rd, 2019. My name is Matt Fury, and this is The Rough Cut. All right. Happy holidays, podcast friends near and far. Hope you're all caught up on your shopping. Maybe you're in your car on the way to the mall right now. What a great time to learn a little bit about editing. And if you're going to learn a little about editing, among other things, have I got someone for you to meet. Our very special guest on today's show, editor Mary Ann Brandon. Ms. Brandon has been quite busy lately. She has a little movie in theaters right now. It's called Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. No real spoilers in this one, so it's safe if you haven't seen the film yet. Together with co-editor Stefan Grub, she has had the awesome and formidable task of working with director J.J. Abrams to bring to a close a 42-year-old franchise, a trilogy of trilogies, as it were. And there really is nothing comparable to Star Wars in the world of not only cinema, but in terms of the cultural impact it's had now on multiple generations, really. And when you take that into account, you really begin to realize that there is just no way this film is ever going to be objectively judged on its own merits as a standalone film. It carries with it the legacy of so many other films created by so many other talented people. Again, going all the way back to 1977. Now, if you're a somewhat faithful listener to The Rough Cut, you'll know that we talked to editor Paul Hirsch a few months ago. Paul edited A New Hope, which, if you're as old as I am and actually saw it in the theater, it will always just be Star Wars to you. Uh, But he edited that film as well as Empire Strikes Back. So maybe you want to check out that podcast with Paul if you have a minute. There's still even time to enter to win a hard copy edition of his autobiography. Details on how to do that are in that podcast. And just like Paul, Marianne Brandon has had a very distinguished career that has showcased her considerable storytelling abilities. And also like Paul, Marianne has had a close working relationship with a specific director. In Paul's case, it was Brian De Palma. For Marianne, it's J.J. Abrams. She has long collaborated with J.J. going back to his TV series Alias, and also on his Star Trek films, as well as the film that rebooted the Star Wars saga, The Force Awakens. But it's all come down to this, Episode 9, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. We grab some of what little time Marianne has during this busy holiday season to talk about the film, so let's put it to good use and get going. I got a good feeling about this one. Here's editor Marianne Brandon. I gotta say, that's about the quickest interview I've ever done. How about it? Like, (laughs) I don't even have to say a word, I just hang up on you. (laughs) You should have interviewed me like a month ago. I, I tried. You popped your head out at Bad Robot, and you're like, I gotta go. <laughs> About, you got, like, more time than most people. <laughs> I feel blessed. Um, <laughs> before we dig into the to the interview, as it were, so the panel was good? Yeah, it was good. I thought it was. I mean, I thought, you know, JJ got to say what he wanted to say. and How was the, how was the audience reaction to the film? It, you know, it's so hard to tell because every version of it I've seen – has been um, with, uh, you know, premiere or, a, you know, academy screening with a panel. So, like, it, you know, it's such a loaded subject, Star Wars. My biggest thing, and I say, I keep trying to say this, is like, in a time where the world is so polarized, it's not a film that should be polarizing. <laughs> I mean, it basically the mess. The message of the film is, "Hey, guess what? You can be bad, and you know, good can come into your life. And maybe you know, if you're open-minded to it, or you, you know, extraordinary things can change your mind. And you have to believe there's always hope. Like it's not that complicated. So when I read these polarizing reviews, where it's like, you know, it's fan service. Look, sure, it's fan service." And then if you didn't service the fans, it would be like, oh, he, he didn't go along with the, the history of Star Wars or what it all means. It, so we, we were in a no win. No question. This was more than just a regular movie. If this was just Rise of Skywalker, a singular film amongst itself, a totally different story. But with the weight of an entire franchise of nine films in total, of multiple directors, of, you know, the story of, you know, it's starting with Lucas and Lucas selling to Disney and just... It's just no way it was ever going to be able to be judged by itself as a film on its own merits. Exactly. So I, you know, I hope people go, I hope they abandon what they think and just get into it and have a good time because it's a fun ride and I wouldn't think too hard about it. 
<laughs> that's not a bad piece of advice for any movie. But um, <laughs> so let's let let's start at the end. Actually, so the film had its world premiere on I think the sixteenth of December and wide release less than forty eight hours ago. When did you officially turn off the media composer and walk away from the editing room, knowing you were you were done? Um, when they basically said, "You guys are done because if you're not, we can't finish the film. I mean, we can't make the territories." So that was the Monday. Right before Thanksgiving. So we're somewhere like November 23rd or something like that, just guessing. Mm -hmm. Which reminds me of a quote from Jeff Ford of Avengers fame who said, you don't finish movies, they just take them away from you, which certainly sounds to be the case here. Well, that was not true of Last Jedi. Apparently they finished like five months early. They were like done. And God bless them for that. But, you know, we were definitely still trying to figure out a lot of stuff. Well, we'll get into that as much as you're comfortable getting into it, but that speaks to, you talk about, you know, Last Jedi wrapping five months ahead of schedule. This film, a little different than Force Awakens, where you had a pretty clear understanding that you would be doing this film, you know, a decent amount in advance. Here, I guess you had three months less to tackle this one than you had for Force Awakens? Yeah. So how did that affect your process? I mean, where could you, how can you make up that time? Well... The way I made up the time, I mean, it was, it's a struggle. I mean, it was because it affected everything, obviously, the script, the art department, the everyone in prep. So about a third of the way through, Kathy was like, JJ has got to spend more time in the cutting room. And I knew that just wasn't going to happen, not with the schedule we were on, not with what he was dealing with on a daily basis, not with all the units that were running. You know, crew was on an eight to six French hours with no break. So I knew that he was just exhausted at the end of the day. There was just not a chance of him, you know, doing that. So I suggested that I cut on the set. And Jane, who's freaking amazing. Jane is your assistant? Jane Tone, yeah. She set up a system where we had two tented rooms, not rooms, but just like tents on, on every set, indoor and outdoor, where we had an avid stationary setup. And then we had a mobile setup. And I just went wherever JJ was. So I was usually within 10 feet of the camera, wherever the camera was. And I just mobily cut. And then between takes, he could sit down with me and he, we could go over things. And um, at first he was a little like, you know, we don't do it this way, Marianne. And I was like, I know, but you know what? We don't really have a choice. And then he really got into it and he really loved it. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was fantastic. <laughs> we just <laughs> cutting on the set. <laughs> it's not uncommon for an editor to be working on location, but that close and that intimately with production is, is a little abnormal. What, um, what benefits did it, did it provide to you or if there were any compromises you had to make, what were those? Well, I didn't really have to make any compromises. You know, it was great for him because we could, first of all, I could pull up anything. So if anyone on the set needed a reference, I immediately had a reference to show them. I think cutting one thing while he was shooting another, he kind of got into the mode of, it was full on Star Wars mode. And then I just think he really enjoyed it. It's like, it was a great use of his time. I think it took some pressure off because we could turn over shots. We could call Roger, our VFX supervisor over and sit down with him while I was working on something and say, you know, can you do this? Can you make this go to that? And also for me, the benefit for me was like, I was really part of that crew and people got used to seeing me there and got used to talking to me. And I think they felt like their work was, they were like seeing results of their work immediately and somehow it boosted everyone's confidence. You know, it wasn't like they would do their job and then it would go off into the ether in some dark room that nobody knew who was touching it or what. It was right there in front of them. And I think it was very exciting for everyone. So even without the time constraints that you had, would you want to do it that way moving forward if you could? Always, yeah. And do you think JJ's now sort of open to that? I think he w- I can't imagine he wouldn't because, quite honestly, I think it made him incredibly happy about it. Like he was just over the moon about getting things done and seeing it in front of him. And then look, there were even moments where we were like, oh my God, what if we had this other shot that we could have? And then we'd set up a green screen and Dan would look at what we had and then we'd shoot the insert right then and there. And then I'd get it off the video feed and put it in and go, I think this works great. Or I didn't, I don't think we got it. Or, you know, I mean, it was just 
I mean, you have the technology. Why wouldn't you do it? It's not that hard. I mean, it's just media, right? And a computer. That's what we say. It's just media <laughs> and a computer. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. I mean, you still have to cut it, yes. And there's a lot of footage, yes. But like the speeder chase, for instance, that scene, a lot of it, you know, I get it. And sure, I can spend a shitload of time trying to figure out what it is for me. But, you know, it's a very time consuming to do that. And, and I, you know, and then I go, I have to do JJ's version anyway. So isn't it make much more sense to be like, so JJ, what did you um, have in mind? And let me cut that version. And then I'll offer up what I think could make it better or where we can go from there. It just seemed like in terms of the time we had, that was really um, the best way to do it. So thinking back to Force Awakens, You've always been so gracious to give me your time and let me do these little interviews with you. Um, so thank you for that. And we were doing one back at Force Awakens, and I started to ask you and and Mary Jo Markey, your co-editor at the time, mm -hmm. about what it was like working on a bad robot production versus other films that you do. And I said, you know, putting aside the J.J. Abrams factor, and you immediately shut me down in the in the graceful way that you can and said you, 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 <laughs> that's very nice <laughs> yeah well you are you said you can't remove jj from the there is no removing him from this and you've worked with him for so long dating back to your, your television days what is it about him that makes him such a great director just from your your vantage point um well jj kind of wears so many hats you know i mean he kind of has he seems to have you know knowledge of like visual effects and plus he's a writer so it's always from a story point of view and you know he and I have such a shorthand about emotions and what um something means and what it ha how it has to land and he's also very funny and very charismatic so the way he tells a joke is quite easily translated into editing a story you know where to hold back where to hold tension so he's just a really multi faceted director and he also I would say, most importantly, he, um, and sometimes, you know, it's too much, but, he, you know, he's very, he has a confidence on the surface that makes you feel like you can try anything because he's so open to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas I think that a less experienced director or somebody with a different personality might not be as open to trying everything that, you know, you can think of. So I think he's unique in that he does wear a lot of hats. Well, he's one of the breakout stars of the film. He's the voice of, of Dio. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you suppose made him decide, Hey, I'd like to be the voice of one of the droids. Well, he, we just put him in as a temp because we didn't have his voice, obviously. And, um, at one point we decided because BB-8 doesn't speak English because R2 doesn't speak English. We felt like it might be nice to have Dio who doesn't say all that much in the film, speak a language you can understand for, you know, certainly for little kids. And um, so he didn't need to be translated. And because they're a droid, they find it just made more sense. And once JJ put his processed voice in, we were like, that. why would we change it? It was totally working. And we learned that lesson from BB-8 because originally we searched and searched for his voice and we ultimately ended up going back to the voice we originally <laughs> had put in and um, because it works. So just as you can't talk about Bad Robot without J.J., you can't talk about Star Wars without Princess Leia and the, and the actor that brought her to life, Carrie Fisher. And that was, you know, unfortunately, one of the elements that you had to deal with in this film is her untimely passing before Episode Nine, but her story arc had not ended yet. Uh, I, right. I think there's obviously going to be a lot of questions about how you so delicately integrated her into the story and the process that you went through to do that. Mm-hmm. So that would be me. <laughs> that would be me asking you how you did it. Um, you know, we did it with great care and amazing amount of patience. And look, we used it's it's no secret that we used a lot of footage from Seven that eventually had not made it into the film, and I had cut those scenes, so I knew those scenes quite well, and. Um, I think Chris and JJ, when they were writing this script, just could not figure, we had to, she had to be in the story. So they wrote scenes around what we had and we very delicately picked out the best of what we had. And, you know, it's all ILM and you know what, 
was a big part of it were the other actors, especially Daisy. I mean, she just sold it, you know. We did have a stand in there that she was acting against, but she really, we show her the scenes of Carrie that we were going to use, and she really sold that Carrie was right there in front of her, you know, talking. And I just credit the emotion and the, the fact that it works to, to, to those actors. And the other stuff I credit to ILM being incredible geniuses. And I think it wasn't easy for them. You know, the lighting had a match The you know, Dan had to look at that footage and then light accordingly. Sometimes we'd have a shot that was shot outside that we wanted to use inside or inside that we wanted to use outside. And, you know, all those things had to be figured out. So there were a lot of heads on that one. Well, it's not uncommon for, for an editor to be brought in early on to look at the script and talk to the director about the script. Taking into consideration your longtime close relationship with JJ, as well as your familiarity with that footage from episode seven, did they bring you in specifically at times to talk about, listen, we're, we're trying to figure out how to make this story work here with the footage that we have from seven. Marianne, what do you remember? What can you... Well, they had all the footage. I mean, JJ, he knew exactly what he had. But, you know, when I did come in and read the script and go through it and spent a lot of time with that footage, you know, I picked out the best of those. You know, they preliminarily picked out the scenes and takes. And then I went through it all again and again and again until we got the takes that worked. So yes, but he and Chris knew that footage intimately by the time I got there. So for what's ultimately a film about big thematic ideas of legacy and lineage and redemption and one's place in the universe and all the things you know you and I talked about earlier, you still have a lot of plot mechanics to drive the story forward and give it momentum. Mm. You know, it's part intergalactic treasure hunt wrapped up in an action movie. And I, kn- <laughs> I know you have plenty of experience telling those kind of stories. Uh, again, TV shows like Alias or movies like Mission Impossible 3. And for those to work, those kind of stories are, are always a balance of setup and context where, you know, you as the storyteller have to explain the mission and establish the stakes. And that's all played out against the thrill and suspense of the actual action taking place. Right. When, when I watch those things, I always get a sense that those are some of the harder things to cut or more precisely, to cut down, you know, maybe that's a better way of putting it, because you don't want to overburden the audience with too much explanation and too much, you know, MacGuffin talk. But at the same time, you don't want them experiencing the action sequences without this clear understanding of the objective. For you, is that like, no, this is second nature to me, or is that one of the elements you always kind of have to spend a little more care and a little more time with on an action film like this? Well, in this film in particular, yes, I'd spend a lot of time with it, because I think, you know, we had a bad guy, then we in, reintroduce a, a batter guy, and then those two have to, you know, they have a plot that's going. And so I think the first couple of reels of the film, certainly the first reel, was full of trying to sort out plot and hopefully not lose an audience or, or overburden an audience with too much story. So, yeah, I spent, I mean... I spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to figure out that out and what was pertinent for the people to know and what got in the way. I think it's always hard on these films because, especially JJ, he likes a complicated plot and he really does appreciate, you know, Alias was crazy complicated and that's what made it so much fun. And so we, it was our job just to make it super clear and try to figure all that out. So, yeah. I do spend a lot of time doing that. But I also spend the majority of my time making sure emotionally you're with our characters. Well, we talked, um, or I guess I didn't really spell it out. Um, you, you had done uh, Force Awakens with Mary Jo Markey, who's somebody you've mm-hmm. worked with a lot with, with JJ. Mm-hmm. She was not on this film. Talk to me about um, your co-editor and how you guys balanced uh, the workload. Well, it's interesting. Um, I've known Stefan for a, lo- a while, and he is... Do you know him at all? I've never, I've seen him. I've never been introduced. Oh, he's a super, super lovely, you know, generous man. And Mary Jo just wanted to move on. She was ready to do something else. And at first I was like, well, that's going to be strange. And I sat down with Stefan and I said, I don't know how you work. But, you know, with Mary Jo, she was very definite that we divide the film and her scenes were her scenes and my scenes were my scenes. And I've always believed in collaboration and I, I went along with it because I felt like I could do, I, fine, I can do that. And, but, and also with Mary Jo and I, once the scenes were cut, of course we collaborated and went back and forth and 
talked about her scenes and talked about my scenes and how they made suggestions. It wasn't that. But with Stefan, I said, I would like to try something different this time. I would love it if because we're three months behind and because it's massive, it's going to be massive. Would you mind if, you know, who, whoever was finished with the sequence just went on to whatever came in next? In other words, so that everything got cut as quickly as possible and we could put it up and see what we had. And he was like, sure, fine. And even and JJ was a little like, what are you doing? I said, I think this is going to work great. And it did. So there were no boundaries. I recut him. He recut me. We sat together. We worked things out, the three of us. It was an incredible experience. And that's not to say the experience I had with Mary Jo wasn't. It just was a different experience. And we also sat together with Mary Jo and I and JJ, but always went back to our corners, you know, to finish. And this was all of us finishing together. So if I was working on something and JJ wanted to work on another scene that I had originally cut, he could just go off with Stefan and work on that scene. It also made you feel like I knew everything in the film intimately, as did Stefan. So you had also mentioned uh, briefly uh, your assistant Jane setting up the, the tents, the location tents. Is this the first film that you have done with her? Because I think I know you'd worked with somebody else for a while. No, I worked with Julian Smirk for a long time, but of course... As all good editors, he wanted to cut, and I was happy for him to... So when I did Passengers, I brought Julian on to help me for 10 weeks get through the editor's cut, which was great. And then he went on to cut something else, and Carrie Blackman was my first on that, but Jane was the second. So Jane has done three films with me now because Carrie went off to do something else. And then, so Jane did Darkest Minds, Venom, and then this. So one thing we always like to ask an editor is, you know, what they look for in a good assistant editor, because that's obviously going to be one of the first jobs somebody has breaking into the career of editorial. What do you look for in a great assistant and and how do you help bring them along so that eventually, like Julian, they're ready to move on to be an editor? First of all, I have to like them. They have to have a great (laughs) sense of humor. (laughs) They have to um, put up with me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's the sense of humor part. Exactly. (laughs) They have to like my children, no matter what. (laughs) You know, they have to be smart. I mean, Jane is just funny and talented, and she's just amazing at her job. I I don't know. I just, I, I usually look for people I feel like I can spend time with, who I like. You know, I I kind of assume they can do the job if I've seen them do the job, but I really look for someone I, I, who would you go out to dinner with? Who would you want to have lunch with? Because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. So those social skills, you think people don't understand or or should know more that being good in the room is is every bit as important, if not more important than your your technical abilities. Yeah. I mean, for me, both. I have to, (laughs) I'm just a hog, but um (laughs) Yes, I think social ability, for me, for other people, no. I, you know, but for me, it's important because, you know, you spend a lot of time at work and a lot of time digging in and intensely concentrating. If I didn't have somebody I could walk in the room with, plop on the couch and be like, who are we hating today? You know, I, it would be horrible. I would love if that we, job. If Jane doesn't work out, would you give me a call? <laughs> right. Who did what to whom today? And how can I hate them for you? Perfect. So you had mentioned you being on set and JJ just being with you as you're cutting and you being there as he's shooting, um, things were a little different. What is it typically, what, what's the contrast to that? On a, on a quote unquote normal movie, for lack of a better term, how would you typically work with him? Well, I probably would send him cuts and then have him, which we did. And, you know, he'd send back his notes and then I'd do those notes and I'd send them back and he'd tell me I did everything wrong. And then I'd send them back and, you know, we'd change our mind, but it's, you know, that's time consuming. It's like texting, you know, mm. you ask one question, you get a kind of an answer and you're like, but what about this? And then instead of, you you know, just walking up to the person and having a conversation. And that's the difference. If you're on the set, the amount of time you cut out is astronomical, right? Because you're just there doing it. And you can always change your mind, but you know, two minds working on something, is especially something you both have the same goal is an easier way to get there. So here's the thing. A director's to me head when they're shooting is in the shoot and in the script. And as an editor, when I come in and say, this isn't working or that's not working, I'm the outsider coming in and kind of 
dropping a bomb. And it's really hard for them to change modes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you can always look at editing and go, I'll deal with that later when I'm done shooting. Sure. I have time. That's later. But imagine if it weren't later. Imagine if it were now. Then you'd be part of the whole process. And you'd get to see the footage. And that's what my goal was about being on the set, was like being part of the shoot. And if I were directing, I would think it would be incredibly useful. Since you brought up directing, that is something you had done in television with Alias. Is that something you would still aspire to do? Would you want to direct a feature? I, I might. I might. I mean, I, I, you know, it just depends on... I certainly think I know enough now to do it. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I don't think directing is just having the knowledge, though. I think you have to have be able to command a crew and have a crew that respects and, you know, wants to do good work for you. And, you know, I've been on crews where I've heard or seen crews where there's a dissent toward the director or people are, you know, can be very judgy about it. And that makes it really hard. And that's one of the things about JJ that's a, unbelievable i that everyone on that set loves him so they rally around and they really so yes i would love to direct a film given the right project and given the right crew and i think those things are really really like i wouldn't want to just go okay i'll just direct this thing without having all that in place because if you can't manage the crew you're not going to get a good film it's going to be hard Star Wars being such an iconic franchise has these signature elements to it that they are given that they're going to be a part of the film. First would be the opening title crawl. And knowing that you went through different versions and you were working right up until the end on just crafting the best story you could, did that title crawl have to get rewritten or altered? Or is that just from, from day one that was locked? Oh. <laughs> Or did it get written as you were packaging up the drives? I mean, it just gets written over and over and over. But then again, you know, on the original one, there was no crawl. And it was, according to legend, it was Brian De Palma who said, if you're going to jump right into the middle of a story, why don't you give us a crawl that tells us what's going on? So as we recrafted the film, we recrafted the crawl. I mean, it was basically... The sentiment was there. But, it, you know, when you start to see it in words, you really have to get it perfect. And I love the way, you know, it starts with the dead speak. That was a later idea. And that's such a Saturday morning serial matinee kind of like, wow. <laughs> it is. And, and yet at the same time, it, it was not, it was a bit of a departure from how those crawls were traditionally written. And it does, it's a, it's as they say in the movie business, a grabber. Yeah. And I think we, when, when JJ came up with it, or Chris did, one of them did, uh, you know, we were all like, yeah, that's it. That speaks to us for this film. So before I ask about the next signature moment from uh, Star Wars films, I, I do want to just sort of take another bit to talk about the versioning. So how did you manage the different versions? Do you have a technique for how you organize these things? So ultimately, in the end, when you decide, you know what, the first one we did was probably the right one in the first place. How do you manage that process? Yeah, Jane does a lot of it. And, um, you know, we have to track, like, ver picture versions, sound versions, music versions. So she has, like, a three-tiered numbering system that, you know, it could be, like, version 10, sound 2, music 5. <laughs> and then, you know, you version up from there. So I could have a version 11, but the sound could still be 2, and the music could still be 5. And then eventually, when we get down the road a ways, I kind of just scroll through them to see which version I'm looking for. But um, when I started editing, I cut films on a moviola. And I've always, even though Avid makes it easy to go back and forth, I usually just go forth. I try not to go backwards because I didn't learn that way. And I, I don't think it's a particularly, I just think you what you remember sometimes as being great isn't so great. So I try to use my memory to go forward and pick out the things I thought were great, you know, and cut those. Do you know, do you know what I'm trying to say? I know exactly what you're trying to say. And what, I, what I'll do is I'll try and bring it around to more of the managing the story arc pieces of it. Because as, as things are changing, and, and you were, you know, so great about illuminating the, the setup and the, you know, the action movie stuff that you have to do, there are things that can happen where hey, if I lose this scene from the beginning, there's, there's, there's a, some new elements of, you know, what powers a Jedi might have in terms of healing 
And there's a scene early on where you have to set that up. You have to show Ray healing this creature. Right, snake, right. right. So that you know later on when she does it, it's like, oh, okay, that's something she can do. Right. So you, you know, from a two and a half hour movie with a lot of stuff going on that sits at the end of a whole franchise with a lot of things going on. How do you, from a story point of view, keep track of all these different things? Do you have any techniques that you use? I know three by five cards are very popular. <laughs> Sometimes we do that, but I keep it in my head. I mean, I'm, if I'm telling a story, I'm trying, I'm thinking back on what I need, you know, where the, an audience will be at. And, you know, then we'll throw the film up on the screen and be like, oh, now we don't understand that they did that. And we talk about it a lot. Stefan, myself, JJ, Michelle, Rajwan, Kathleen, Chris, we sat in a room a lot and talked about like, we need this to say that. And you've got a lot of people kind of weighing in on that and tracking the story from de- several different points of view. They love those points of view in Star Wars. They do. <laughs> so I mentioned that there was another signature move from Star Wars that um, I noticed in this film because I didn't notice it. And that was the wipes. Um, you know, Star Wars is famous for its diamond wipes and circle wipes and shape wipes and all kinds of wipes. And I noticed one in the film. And when I noticed it, I realized like, wait a minute, have I seen another one? And then I kind of kept an eye out for, would there be another? Was there a conscious decision about, you know, using the wipes or not using the wipes? And and am I wrong? Did I miss a bunch? And it's just like, yeah, no, there was a ton in there. I think you might've missed some. There were probably more than you think. And we made, they were very soft this time. And that was something JJ decided on. And we had more in at one point and then we took them out. We didn't feel we needed them. So we only used them where we felt they were needed. We didn't use them gratuitously. So that's really the best answer. It wasn't conscious, no. Okay. It just we used them as we felt we needed. That's probably the best answer you could ever give to anything about, <laughs> about a movie. Exactly. Exactly. I had talked to you at one time about Force Awakens, just about things that you rely on to help you. And in these visually visual effects intensive movies, you had talked about, listen, I always like to get a clean plate of a scene to work with so I have more flexibility. Am I recalling that correctly? And if I am, could you explain a little bit about what that's all about and how it helps you? Oh, it helps us because if we ever, you know, need to go back into a scene and uh, we don't have that set anymore, we can always just film the actor over green screen. And so we don't have to go back to, you know, Ireland and Skellig Island. We have Skellig Island on a in in plates and we can shoot the close-up or the line that we need and on this film stefan group had a great idea and so we went a step further and he asked jj to film sequences where there were more than two characters talking if there was four or five characters talking to and there was a camera move could he film it without dialogue with the characters sort of doing what they're doing like shaking their head or moving or you know same blocking And uh, that came in handy as well at some point when we decided to take some dialogue out, but we needed a wide shot. So we've taken that concept even further now. (laughs) Well, it's funny you mention that because we've been talking, or I've been talking to uh, feature film editors that do animation a little more than I usually do lately, and just trying to immerse myself in that world and and understand that world better. And I know that's something you've done as well. Um, Mm -hmm. So the track it got me on is realizing that if you've got a character that's not, I'm not seeing their mouth move. And it could be a stormtrooper. It could be, you know, Zori, the new character. You can literally put whatever words you want in their mouth at any moment. Does that happen a lot uh, on this film where you can go back and just say, you know what, let's instead let's have Carrie Russell say this or let's have the stormtrooper say that? Sure. We'll use any trick. <laughs> you're you're not <laughs> shameless. We're shameless. No, of course. I mean, that's what you will often see in movies when um, an over the shoulder shot where someone's you know, a line has been put in over their shoulder and you kind of from the side see that they're not really moving their mouth, but you know, you've hidden the, you, I mean, in the best version of that, you don't see that at all, but you know, you can kind of see maybe sometimes their jaws not really moving and there's a line because you're looking at the person they're talking to. And, um, you know, often we often use that to try to beef up dialogue or say what we need to say or get something in there. Um, so it's not only the mass characters, it's, it's anybody. And sometimes we've even had on any of the films I've done, we'll have the visual effects people put something over their mouth. Like 
you know, a strategically placed arm or something that hides them, say, not talking. <laughs> So there's a lot of tricks you can use. Well, speaking of visual effects and tricks, uh, Marty Cloner, somebody you've worked with Mm -hmm. for a long time, he is on this film again with you. Mm -hmm. What is your process working with him? Because the thing that's unique about Bad Robot, at least to me, is compared to the size of the projects you do, it's a relatively small studio. It's a very Mm -hmm. close-knit, very creative environment where you're really parallel. You're really integrated together. How do you work with Marty um, in terms of incorporating his work? And is that... Is that different, the process of Bad Robot and working with Marty, different than like on, a, on another film, like a Sony project like Venom? No, I mean, I use Marty to, you know, if I wanted to fill in green screens or sometimes if I want to manipulate a shot or enhance something visually, he's great at that. He's great at compositing. He's great at adding. You know, he put in a lot of the lasers and the, the lightsabers before we had ILM do it. He'll, keep, you know, if I wanted somebody to not talk, he, he can shut their mouths for me. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, fantastic having someone like Marty. And also, when I did Venom, I had a, Tom Reagan was my visual effects supervisor. And not, I'm a visual effects editor. And he would just, as Marty does, you know, they just kind of, if they're really good, they preempt what you're going to ask them and they've already done it, you know. And so you go... You, you come in and go, I need that laser. And Marty's like, it's already done. It's in your bin. So he'll go through a scene and he'll, you know, add stuff to it for me that he knows. And we've been working together so long, I think he kind of knows what I'm going to ask for. So um, it's great. I mean, it's invaluable on these films because a lot of it isn't quite there when you're cutting it and you have to imagine it. And when you show it to a studio or a director, you know, it's a lot easier if you have more st- <laughs> the stuff you need and then to constantly explain, well, that's going to really be to the right. and Over his shoulder, you're going to see the thing that he looks at. And those guys just put it in for you. Well, that seems like something that um, has become more common, but but really that JJ and Bad Robot were sort of ahead of the curve in having a more finished, more cinematic experience in quote unquote offline. For sure. Right down to the audio. I mean, I, I remember you guys doing 5-1 earlier than I, I remember other people doing it. Oh, yeah. And incorporating more of Marty's work. This is the same thing with the whole true with sound design is Robbie Stambler's, you know, doing stuff, you know, for you as your... Yeah, Robbie's was on it. Yeah, he's on it from day one. And, you know, can you do this, you know, I'd hand sequences over to him all the time, as did Stefan. So which is harder? Rebooting a franchise or ending it? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think probably ending it is a little bit harder. Just the pressure of bringing it to a close? Oh, you know, I think the reboot, people were so excited. And sure, there were people who were going to be like, you know, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. Or I love, these are my beloved characters. But they're also so happy to see the characters again. I think ending it, they've had a chance to see two other films. So they, their expectations or whatever they formulated in their minds is what they want to see. So you're never going to please everyone in that regard. And you know, they have a longer time to make up their mind what it is. So I think ending, yes. <laughs> so putting aside the time constraint part of it, what was the most challenging aspect of editing The Rise of Skywalker? Oh my God, really? <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> Um, I think it was trying to, uh, I think that maybe the hardest part was giving every character a satisfactory emotional journey and making sure we didn't stay too long or not long enough and making sure the audience could feel what each character was going through so that by the end they were satisfied that their characters that they loved and hated we're all service in not service is the wrong word, but brought to an emotional part where they could say goodbye. Well, Marianne, talking to you is always a satisfying emotional journey. <laughs> <laughs> or not, or a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, history will decide, but I loved it. I'm so happy you did. It's always a pleasure to talk to oh, you, you, Matt Fury. <laughs> Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is in theaters now, where I suspect it will be for quite a little while. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. Definitely something you want to see in a theater with a great screen and great sound. The Force is strong with that Marianne Brandon, and she did a terrific job under what had to be an enormous amount of pressure. If you couldn't tell, I love talking with Marianne. 
Not only is she a lot of fun, but I always learned something from her, and I hope you did too. As for you, young Jedi, time to complete your training and get your hands on Avid Media Composer, the same editing system that's been from one end of the galaxy to the next with the Star Wars saga. There are great deals on Media Composer going on right now. As always, I'll put a link in the show notes that'll take you right to those deals. That'll do it for me. I'm a little behind on my holiday shopping too, so it's time to get going on that. But don't worry, I have you on my list. I'm going out and getting you another podcast. Until it's time to finally open it, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>